How's it going? I'm Sydney. I am a writer, photographer, and silversmith living in Reno, Nevada. Welcome to my channel, my very first video ever of all time, which is definitely awkward, but I'm trying to do my best. Uh, I am just starting out on my own, uh, doing my own content. Um, the past 10 years, I worked for the Nevada Division of Tourism, Travel Nevada. I was their content manager, which meant a lot of things through the years. Uh, I was originally hired to write and shoot photos and build a photo library of all the things to see and do in Nevada outside of Reno and Las Vegas. So really all, you know, rural Nevada experiences. Um, and when I was first hired, you know, I was in the field 60% of the time. And then every other waking moment, my husband and I have pretty much camped and experienced most things in rural Nevada, um, seeing a lot of Nevada's wild places. Um, Nevada has more public lands than any other state, so really there's not a ceiling around here for a lot of public lands le recreation. Um, and I quit my job in November, and now I am pretty much going out on my own, trying to do my own thing, writing, photography, uh, and silversmithing. You can find that on my website, findingnevadawild.com, where I've been making all these really cool pendants and hat pins, and they're all mined in Nevada, made by Nevadans. Um, so yeah, we've got to do some really badass experiences through the years, like hiking Nevada's five tallest peaks. Um, we've backpacked the Ruby Crest Trail. We've fished a ton of alpine lakes. We've gone to one of the most remote places in the world for the best stargazing, one of the seven darkest skies in the world. Uh, Nevada has more hot springs than any other state. So I think we've pretty much, you know, hot springs are part of my personality at this point. We've been to uh, most of the hot springs you can put your body in in Nevada rock hounding, I mean, all kinds of incredible experiences that um, exist only here, but are also the best experiences of their kind in the West and world. Um, so yeah, I'm excited because I'm going to try to do this YouTube thing and see where it goes and kind of try to mesh all my skills together and passions really together into one um platform. So this weekend, we're super excited because we're headed out to northeastern Nevada to check out some sage grouse. So if you don't know about these guys, I'll tell you along the way, they're basically like this dinosaur bird that is super, basically so picky in particular, it's evolved itself out of life. <laughs> and uh, Nevada has a lot of restrictions in place towards protecting these really specialized habitats that they have to live in. Um, you can find sage grouse pretty much north of the Nevada test site, but really in the northeastern part of the state, Elko County, which is also where most of the best recreation is in the state, in my opinion. Um, that's where a lot of these sage grouse habitats are found. So we're gonna hit the road see some dinosaur birds. I'm going to try my best to make a piece of silver in the field. So let's do it. Okay, here we go. We're leaving the camper because it's too cold. We can't camp anywhere. Elko's like the freaking frozen Arctic tundra right now. Got everything packed. Janky's making me bring this stump with us. Where are you? Janky? It's not a stump. World meet Jengi Martangi. He's the safety and operations man. I'm the content and uh, food lady. Safety and logistics. That's right. Those are the... He's safety and logistics. All right. We have everything packed up, I think, right? I don't really know. We're doing it. Here we go. conservation in the United States but also the world whoa and uh, they have a field biology station up in the Goshute Mountains where they invite the general public to come out there and just participate in these bird migration surveys the Pacific Flyway goes right over the Goshute Mountains and kind of like funnels all of these birds into the Goshutes 
they have permits to capture wild birds out of the sky, survey them, like do all these different, measure their feathers and their breast fat and all these different things that they're studying because if there's a problem with the raptor population, they're an indicator species, which means that if there's a problem with them, there's larger environmental concerns at play. So anyway, we did that in September and that was really cool, wasn't it? It was. We saw a red tail. They caught a red tail hawk. They caught a kestrel right out of the sky. They caught a cooper's hawk. And we saw a bunch of birds. Um, so yeah, we are bird nerds and we're excited to go out and see some sage grouse. What do you think uh, this is going to be like, Jenky? I don't know. I don't know what to expect. I've only seen pictures of sage grouses. Grouse? Bruce? Gross. Grouse. It's, it's gross. Gross. A gross. A gross. A gross. A gross. I'm going to catch a sweet lecture. Is that a pun? A lecture. It's an old grouse pun. It's an old grouse joke. Yeah. Other than that, I don't know what to expect. We're going to an undisclosed location where they have been known to grouse around, I guess. Oh, I got to see some leaf sage grouse a long time ago. I was working and there were a couple of leks on these ranchers' property up in northeastern Nevada. And I knew that the property owner was going to get up first thing in the morning and go do like a voluntary, voluntary, uh, tally for Endow about all of these sage grouse leks on their property and I asked if I could come along with them, and she said yes. So I got to see some in action one other time and they're super cool. Like you can't really describe what you're going to see. It's just it's like prehistoric. That's the best way. Um, but yeah, these guys, the greater sage grouse are a controversial topic in Nevada because they are so finicky and require such a specialized habitat in order to survive and they pretty much almost went extinct a couple years ago but a lot of uh, conservationists around the state have fought to protect their sagebrush step rangeland essentially where they need to live um, and populations have increased a lot so we're excited stay on the highway and just see this I mean no wonder I, I understand your negative perception of Nevada if this is all that you do but if you go out there off the highway this is one of the most complex places ever it's the Great Basin Desert it's one of America's four desert systems and almost the entire state of Nevada is covered in the Great Basin Desert except for a tiny corner on the bottom which is the Mojave Desert and there's hardly any outlets to the ocean. I think there's four total outlets to the ocean. So it's just one big arid basin. It's the driest state in the country. And it also has a lot of other really badass superlatives if you take the time to get off this stupid construction zone highway and go see them. One of them is it's the most mountainous state in the lower 48 states. There's more than 300 named peaks in Nevada. Home to the darkest skies in the the west and world. I mean, Massacre Rim is one of the seven darkest skies on the planet. So dark that on a moonless night, stars can actually cast a shadow up there. And uh, it's so dark that scientists and astronomers were able to discover new parts of the Milky Way galaxy from up there. And that's pretty much the truth. Everywhere beyond Reno and Las Vegas, the skies are dark. There's more hot springs than anywhere else. 
Um, all of that geologic and mineral diversity is one of the reasons that led to Nevada statehood with the discovery of the world's largest silver strike. I mean, the desert is just as complex a place as the ocean. There's so much to see out there and this is not the way to do it. <laughs> is it janky? Nah. You gotta get deep out there. You gotta get deep in some Nevada wild to see the cool stuff. What's the biggest mis misconception you can think of about Nevada? That it's a desert wasteland. But what's interesting to me is you pass through every single one of these mountain ranges and you always wonder, man, I wonder what, if there's anything cool in that canyon or down that valley. And there usually is. Even if there's nothing there. it to Elko. It is, let's see what time, 745, 52 degrees. <laughs> shut this down or what we have to oh, no. don't think I only got three hours of sleep <laughs> uh. yeah. pretty much every single pocket we have we have like a garnet or a turquoise nugget inside of huh they're good for trading Right. The Nevada backroads barter system. We're going to go look at a lek. And so that's a discrete spot on the ground where male sage grouse come to strut and display, and then the hens will come in to breed. Um, and so North Ruby Valley um, has a lek pretty close to the highway that we can get everybody to and stand there and, and look at it. And uh, that was the challenge when we were initially setting this up, is how do we get a bunch of people in a bus out to the lab and not disturb them? So. When is the last time you were on a bus? A school bus. One this long? <laughs> I can't remember. cold but we we saw some grouse we grouse the grouse didn't we grouse we grouse it the, the grouse We're delirious but it's okay I usually get when people 
people ask questions, how many sage grouse are in the valley? Um, that's kind of a tough question. The last formal population estimate that we did was in 2021, and that population estimate put our populations in Nevada between 30 and 37,000. All right, we just finished our sage grouse experience. It was awesome. We had such a good time. We were out there maybe for a couple hours. Um, we left at 4.30 a.m., went out to this really remote lek on the northern end of Ruby Valley, and we were at the lek for maybe like an hour, hour and a half, um, and then we went back to the clubhouse, and it was really cool because they provided breakfast, so the event was sponsored by the Nevada Department of Wildlife, BLM, um, Nevada Gold Mines, there were a bunch of like I think uh, USGS, US Forest Service are a bunch of like state and federal collaborators to make this annual sage grouse event happen and it was totally free. I'd say there were what maybe like 40 people who showed up. Yes. And yeah they carted us out there. We saw the sage grouse. They set up a bunch of scopes for us. There was a photographer with like a crazy long lens that was able to get some really detailed shots. Um, and then they brought us back to the Elko Basque Clubhouse and provided really good breakfast burritos and fruit and coffee. And then we listened to three different presentations. And I thought that that was super interesting. I mean, besides the fact that we were all really, really sleep deprived and a few people were falling asleep <laughs> after that presentation. Not me. It was really cool because the first presenter was a representative from Endow, the Department of Wildlife, and he had worked there for 30 years. And a lot of the themes of his presentation were basically like, you know, conservation and the importance of hunting and the sage grouse. There is a hunting season, which is really surprising, seeing as what a threatened species they are. Um, but he just gave kind of like a basic overview of the sage grouse. And then the second presentation was from a scientist who has devoted the last like at least 10 or 11 years of his career to studying the sage grouse and only the sage grouse. So he had this like very science minded presentation and gave, you know, a really comprehensive rundown. He was from USGS. Yeah, he was. He gave a really uh, comprehensive rundown. Um, about just like all the threats of the sage grouse and what we can do to improve their habitat and that was really fascinating that was like a very scientific presentation with a lot of graphs and charts and everything and then the third presentation was from Nevada gold mines which was another very interesting perspective because you know they're a gold mine they're damaging the earth <laughs> and they he bit his entire presentation was basically about all the conservation that they work in partnership with private landowners. Um, to and base, public. It was mostly private, but yeah, it was public too. But um, yeah, it was really interesting because his entire presentation was basically like what they're, they know that they're doing a lot of harmful things to the earth, but what they can do to give back to like sagebrush habitat, which bolsters, of course, sage grouse populations but a bunch of other wildlife so it was really cool I really really enjoyed those presentations and I feel like it just added so much more to the wildlife observation um, and I think for me the message there was about the sagebrush I mean I was going into it really excited to learn about the sage grouse of course but it was fascinating because it was all about sagebrush and what a delicate ecosystem it is and how it's vanishing in a place like Nevada. Um, yeah, I thought that was really, I didn't expect that and I really enjoyed that. What was your favorite part of the presentation? I just learned so much. I had no idea that sage grouse actually ate sagebrush primarily. I know, yeah. They, it's a I toxic no plant and it's one of the only species that can process it and eat it and it's like 90 percent of their diet is eating the sagebrush and bugs and bugs but the sagebrush was like a main source they eat little baby mormon crickets when they're little chicks yeah yeah there were a lot of 
different pieces. I mean, we learned, like I said, across the three presentations. It was, it was really good, really complete, well-rounded, and like it was free. That was so cool. And it cost a dime. Jenkins drank all the coffee in Elko and now he switched to Rockets with Monster Energy Drink. Because it's good for you. And we're, we're trying to just like unscramble our brains, download, and record all of the sage grouse facts for life. We power napped. It was pretty good. It was honestly pretty okay, you know what I'm saying? Jang, how much sleep did you get? I got like maybe five, ten minutes. I think I got like 45. That's impressive. So like we were saying on the way out, you know, to Elko to do the sage grouse experience, this is the sagebrush sea. And people drive through Nevada and think that this is such a blah, boring desert, you know, the sagebrush is Nevada's state flower and they think that it's dead and desolate and just this empty, barren, ugly landscape. But the truth is, it's a really fragile ecosystem that provides a habitat to hundreds of plants and animal species. And without it, they couldn't thrive. You know, the like the, the pronghorn antelope is an example, the burrowing owl, and of course the greater sage grouse, you know, couldn't survive. So what a better place to get out in the middle of the place that we love the, the best than the sagebrush kingdom and make a piece of song dog silver inspired by the Great Basin State. Here's our stone today, an homage to the greater sage grouse. It looks a lot like it, doesn't it? Yellows and blacks and whites. Perfect for those alpha males we saw strutting around that lek earlier this morning. So the sagebrush ecosystem like you see around us is only found in North America and only found in the American West, which is pretty impressive. I thought that that was like definitely the message from this morning that was the most powerful to me. You know, I thought we were going and, and learning about the, uh, the sage grouse, which we did, but honestly, it was just an incredible reminder of the ecosystem that we have that surrounds us that we as Nevadans know is a sacred landscape, but man, it sure gets dismissed by a lot of people. But you know, in such a harsh environment out here, that's what the sage grouse thrives in. The, it, the sagebrush is 90% of a sage grouse's diet and they're the only vertebrate on earth that can eat and process sage grouse for nutritional value. We didn't learn know this until today, but sagebrush is totally toxic. And I can't I can't believe I it took all this time for me to understand that, but I mean, it's toxic and most animals can't tolerate it, but it's the 90% of the sage grouse's diet. So like most different bird species, you know, the, the male is the flashy one. It's always the female that's like the brown and gray one, but it's true in sage grouse, sage grouse land. Uh, but both males and females are pretty small. They vary between a crow and a goose in size. And females are mostly grays and browns with flecks of white along their necks and breast. And then males have a black belly and um, a head with a yellow stripe over their eyes and they've got this like super white collar that when they're mating it stands up so they're super bright white and then they have these yellow sacks inside of their chest that inflate and like bounce around when they're doing this mating dance but the interesting thing that we learned about today is that um, while the males have white on their breast they'll molt it later on in the year so most of the time we're like how have we seen all these grouse all over Nevada we've never seen a male sage grouse what happens to them the biologist today said that they molt them so most chances are if you see a sage grouse it could be like 50 50 male or female but 
the interesting thing is that their tail feathers, I thought that it might be like a plume of different feathers that makes that point, and that it's one feather each that looks like that turkey plume, like a pointy peacock on the back, which is just like wild. And today that we learned that the sage grouse can live a lifespan of three to eight years. Eight sounds like it's a pretty extreme case, but um, yeah, that's, I mean, they were saying also that like uh, your average um, chucker or quail only lives, you know, something like a couple of years. They can just roost and mate and have successful clutches of eggs. Sage grouse, it's like, it's rare for them to live for eight years, but they can. Each grouse is a very finicky creature. Um, they, of course, survive on sage brush, but they're very, very particular about where they build their habitat. And those habitats are called leks, L-E-K. And the lek habitat that they're looking for is like a very, very secluded part of rural Nevada, away from cities, towns, lights, sound. And they're looking for sagebrush to do, to you know, do everything. And once they select their lek habitat, they do everything within that ecosystem. They mate there, they roost there, they have their babies there, they live there. And so they're looking for this like very particular, perfect ecosystem to make it all happen inside of. And they're not just looking, you might think, okay, well, that could be anywhere. That would be great. They're looking for a very, very particular ecosystem with tall sagebrush. So the sagebrush that they're looking for is typically called mountain sagebrush, which is like six to eight feet. They're looking for shelter, they're looking for cover, um, and really they just do everything inside of that all the time, except for mate. The males do their mating dance out in this like open exposed area of the lek where they can really show off, try to attract a hen, and uh, mate. So the crazy thing about the sage grouse lex is that they're in crazy decline because their habitat keeps getting threatened. Their population is dwindling um, and they're having a hard time surviving and selecting a, cor a correct habitat where they can do all of this in. Um, but even then, Endow, our D Department of Wildlife Biologists, estimate that there are around 2,000 leks in Nevada. Whether those are totally active or not, um, they aren't 100% sure, but that's still a pretty big number. I mean, considering that it's a, a population of bird that is under threat. So sage grouse can eat sagebrush and not other types of seeds. You know, a lot of other grouses can eat seeds. Like that's a pretty big part of a, of a bird's diet is eating seeds, but a, a grouse can't do that because it doesn't have a special muscle in its throat in order to be able to like digest and process that. So instead, that's one of the reasons why, you know, it basically evolved itself out of that, can eat sagebrush, but sagebrush, if you can believe it, even though it feels like it's everywhere all the time, is vanishing around us at a pretty rapid rate, at least according to one of the scientists who presented this morning. So the crazy thing about Lex is in order for it to be considered a healthy Lex, there's about, it only just needs about like a dozen males. And then Oh, there's all the hens, of course, but they were saying today that some of the leks that are up like way deep in northeastern Nevada uh, have had 200 sage grouse, which is just completely wild. Um, and the good news is that even though their ecosystems are pretty much under threat, sage grouse can live in 15 of, of Nevada's 17 counties. So that's all but Clark, which is where Las Vegas is, and Washoe County, which is where Reno is. Most of the healthy leks are found in central Nevada, which is, you know, the Smith Creek Valley has been awarded many conservation uh, designations and recognitions and awards because of all of the work that they've done to create a, this specialized habitat for the sage grouse. 
and then up to where we are today in northeastern Nevada, anywhere really in Elko County uh, is prime habitat for these guys. And again, they're they're looking for areas that are dark. There's no sounds. There's not a lot of you know open space where their natural predators can prey on them. Um, and a lot of that is up in northeastern Nevada. So we know that the, um, you know, they're, they're really selective about their habitat. They also have a very specialized diet, but also one of the reasons that sage grouse is under threat is that the sagebrush is disappearing. It might not really feel like it is, but it is. Uh, and without sagebrush, there's no sage grouse. So I think that was one of the really interesting things that the, the scientist today that we heard from was talking about was that uh, although it doesn't feel like it in Nevada, the sagebrush ecosystem is under threat. And I'm always excited in talking about Nevada's limitless possibilities and a mostly untouched, unfenced, truly wild landscape, you know, one of the last wild places in the country. But I'm talking about that from a recreational standpoint, not a land conservation standpoint. And the truth is, you know, he really highlighted that, that there's so much that's happening in rural Nevada developmental wise that is really threatening the sagebrush ecosystem, which I thought was interesting. So there's suburban development, you know, there's mineral extraction from all of the mines, it has, it has been since man arrived or, you know, European explorers arrived in Nevada, we've been mining and decimating a lot of the landscape. And then there's the wild horse population that's eating a lot of the, um, you know, vegetation and sagebrush. And then there's wildfire, devastating wildfires that are wiping out a lot of the sagebrush ecosystem. And then of course there's geothermal power plants that are going in. And we had a really interesting conversation about that today because, you know, unlike some of the other renewable energy out there, um, geothermal plants are loud. They're really loud. They're super duper bright and there's a really big impact on the, the ecosystem that surrounds. He was talking a lot about a, a geothermal plant in Nevada that they had really taken a closer look at its impact. And basically, you know, they studied what happened with the sage grouse and the animals that were right there in the valley. And then they kept going out in a bigger and bigger radius. And it seemed like, what did they say, five miles? It was like five or 10 miles beyond the geothermal plant. Um, was really where they started to see not as much impact, but there was it pushed almost all the wildlife out of the valley, which is sad. You know that that uh, if we do that, we're not going to have the sage grouse around and a lot of other animals that depend on the, the sagebrush ecosystem, which was a really interesting perspective. So another reason that they're under threat too is, of course, they're predators, which these a-hole ravens. Oh my God! Lately, all we've been hearing about is how these evil ravens have just been really messing everybody up, including desert tortoise. They're just everywhere. There's too many of them. I think they said that the population of the, the ravens increased like 200% in the last few years. And part of that's related to, you know, urban sprawl in the desert where if there's people, there's ravens. But um, one of the interesting things that they were talking about is power lines even going through the middle of Nevada. And that's where big birds like a raven will roost and populate and just keep having babies and preying on all different types of animals out there, but especially the sage grouse. Well, they'll just, you know, dive bomb a male that's doing its mating display or, you know, disrupt a hen's roost, her nest and force her out of a lek. So a lot of that's, you know, predator too, which was, was really interesting. So one of the things that they were talking a lot about too is how Montana and Wyoming's uh, sage grouse and lek habitat stability is so much stronger than Nevada's, but really Nevada has, you know, just as much at one point it did sagebrush conservation and rangelands. And they're really trying to figure out why. And they're thinking that one of the reasons is really because of the cheat grass invasion happening here, unlike anywhere else. And then that's really, you know, of course, causing a lot of devastating wildfire. But I think one of the things that I always think about wherever I go all the time in Nevada is besides whose land am I on and is it okay that I'm here is I just always want to think about, you know, what is my impact of being here? What, what's going on all around me? And even with these elusive birds everywhere, you know, it's like they could be around us right now and we wouldn't know it. And I would be so horrified to wreck a, a creature's entire ecosystem 
that affects their livelihood and generations of their livelihood. So I think, you know, it's just a good reminder of what is our impact out there? How can we keep the Nevada story going for good? Whew, it's been a wily ride. <laughs> I think from this experience, uh, I've definitely learned a lot, uh, but I'm looking really forward to getting better and better each time. I've got a lot of really good ideas about um, being out in the places that I love the most and making a piece of tangible Nevada in those locations. Um, so stay tuned for more. More good stuff coming your way. Can we just get a shout out too to uh, safety and logistics operations man? Look at this. This man hauled a stump into the middle of the freaking desert for me. If that's not commitment to Nevada, I just don't know what is. <laughs> <laughs>